Hello, and welcome to SBTI's Training for Financial Institutions. This session covers Module 1, The Case for Change. In this module, we'll be giving you an overview of why the global economy and financial institutions are taking action. This is the first module in our series. After completing this module, you will be able to explain the urgency and nuances around global clean energy revolution, plan for key changes required for the net zero transformation, articulate the business case for being a net zero transformation leader. Let's get started. The greenhouse effect sits at the heart of the climate discussions. In general, greenhouse gases naturally warm the earth when they're trapped by the sun's heat in the atmosphere. However, over the last century, human activities have caused increasingly high concentrations of greenhouse gases, which is trapping too much heat. As you can see on the graph, which shows global carbon dioxide emissions from energy and land use, emissions driven by human activities have doubled since 1975. Despite the dip due to COVID-19, it is clear that dramatic action is needed to reduce emissions levels from business as usual. Many industries are contributing to emissions in our atmosphere. These emissions are outpacing the capacity of the Earth's natural sinks to absorb them. In this visual, you can see the array of activities that are contributing, particularly driven by electricity production, food, agriculture, and land use, and industry. However, the natural world cannot keep up with all the CO2 emissions we are producing. Natural coastal and ocean and land sinks are only able to absorb 40% of the emissions we produce. That leaves nearly 60% in the atmosphere, requiring us to limit the amount of total emissions coming from the left side, which is our primary objective here today, while also investing in ways to better capture and absorb excess carbon. Taking that action to close that 60% gap and limit global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius requires us to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And this in turn requires us to have greenhouse gas emissions in this decade, as shown by the dotted line that intersects with the blue pathway. However, we're not close to that yet. The red pathway toward an almost three degree future is where current policies and actions will take us. The purple pathway showing a 2.1 degree trajectory is associated with national pledges and targets that in most cases have not yet been embedded into policy. But neither of those are enough to get us to 1.5 degrees, which is why the corporate sector has such an important role to play in accelerating emission reductions. Taking action is important, but we also must realize that making this energy and land use transi transition requires balancing decarbonization and equitable outcomes. First, we need the net zero transformation to be clean in order to reduce or eliminate the emissions of greenhouse gases through cleaner approaches and better sinks. Second, we need reliable access to energy and agricultural resources at the scale necessary for economic prosperity. Again, all of this is for both the developing and the developed world. Third, we need affordable solutions that enable economically feasible solutions for all nations and consumers a premium that consumers may pay for green products, often called the green premium, needs to be brought down. Finally, a secure climate mitigation plan that ensures uninterrupted supply that is resilient to weather, economic, and political factors. All of this is very real to many countries in the world right now. Stakeholders of all types are calling companies to action. You see shareholders putting forth climate proposals, consumers beginning more sustainable brands, governments taking strong regulatory action, and employees and broader civil society demanding more from the companies they work for and associate with. Over the past decades, these voices helped give rise to the voluntary corporate climate action ecosystem in which SBTL plays an important role. One group that's particularly important are governments. As you can see here, national commitments are accelerating. These are important signals to the business community that the world is moving toward a low carbon future. However, many of these commitments are still in the early days. As of early 2022, only 10% of these national commitments have been translated into law. Some of these government's regulators are increasingly weighing in with implications on companies' actions. Here, we provide a few selected examples. 
The EU has long been a leader in carbon regulation, beginning with the establishment of the first international cap and trade program, the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme in 2005. Recently, the EU codified its carbon reduction ambition through the Fit for 55 package, which requires EU member states to reduce their emissions by 55% by 2030. In addition, the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation mandates use of the EU taxonomy to report on green activities. This requirement applies to financial market participants, large companies, and EU member states. The European Central Bank also recently announced plans to conduct stress tests and introduce climate risk disclosure requirements for banks. Similarly, in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Federal Reserve are making moves. For example, the SEC, which oversees financial securities laws, has proposed regulations to enhance and standardize climate-related disclosures for investors. In Asia, financial regulators are engaging in similar activities to codify financial reporting taxonomies and climate risk disclosure requirements. Even as policymakers and regulators ramp up their engagement on climate, financial instruments are being looked to as other important agents for change. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero estimates that approximately 32 trillion US dollars will be required to catalyze energy transformation across several key sectors in the next decade, with the largest investments required in electricity generation, transport, buildings, and low emission fuels. These projections indicate that 80% of that investment will take place in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, as the economies in these regions pivot from carbon emitting to low carbon activities. As you can see on the far right, projected investment in Asia Pacific is larger than that in North America and Europe combined as a result of the large population and rapid industrialization in that region. 32 trillion is a lot of investment, and that needs to be coupled with a shift away from carbon intensive assets in current portfolios. However, it's important to recognize that financing this transformation will occur over time and does not imply that an immediate overnight divestment is required. The clean energy transformation requires both near-term and long-term actions. In the near term, leading companies can commit to setting decarbonization ambitions and targets and to measuring, tracking, and disclosing progress on emissions reductions. SBTI helps companies accomplish these near-term objectives. In addition to those short-term actions, financial institutions must increasingly focus on the long-term. A successful ESG strategy requires investing in greener assets, actively engaging clients on their own transformation strategies, and working with clients and inside the business to improve data accuracy. Individual company portfolios may shift gradually through more investment in green assets, engagement with traditional assets to help them transform, and limited divestment. This does not imply that any of this will be easy. However, companies that act early have an opportunity to play a major role in transforming the energy economy. There are several activities financial institutions must consider in order to play an active role in the clean energy transformation. Here are a few examples of how setting a science-based target can help companies transform their products and services, engagement activities, and operations. By setting a science-based target, companies are able to give a sense of direction throughout their companies that enables all of this. We've discussed how decarbonization will require long-term planning. It will also require companies to set strategies that can adapt over time to changing circumstances as the clean energy transformation unfolds. A company must also embed decarbonization into the business in order to drive change, including in key KPIs, financial controls, and investment activities. The client engagement of tomorrow will look different from today. Leading financial institutions are developing concrete mechanisms to catalyze decarbonization efforts among their clients. We'll talk about this more in module nine on governance, change management, and meeting targets. Engagement with peers and policymakers will become more robust, particularly in order to ensure a level playing field and appropriate roles for the real economy versus the financial economy. We touch upon aspects of this in module two on the voluntary climate action ecosystem and in Module 7's data considerations. Opportunities to expand product and services will grow quickly, particularly with regards to advisory services and alternative financial products. 
Finally, data practices will have to vastly improve in order to gain the deeper insights required for transformation. We deep dive into this in module seven, data considerations. Again, this feels like a lot of change and it is. However, setting a science-based target is important groundwork for a net zero future and gives a clear signal about the role financial institutions will play in this future. So what happens to financial institutions who make these first moves? Early assessments show the pioneers may have more advantages than the followers and laggards that take a more passive approach. On the left-hand side, you can see the advantages of being a pioneer. Early exposure to growing industries, optimal phasing of the transformation, mission and media by the industry, an opportunity to provide perspective to climate regulators, and long-term growth and profitability, which we'll touch upon in the next slide. How does this compare to the disadvantages that laggards face? These financial institutions may have more prolonged exposure to declining industries that force last minute divestitures. They won't be known as the industry leaders, more so as the ones who lost out on a transformative opportunity. Given they are behind, they won't have developed the capabilities necessary to succeed in the medium and long term. Finally, because of all this, they'll have a harder time recovering. Early studies show that financial institutions who act early may reap significant benefits. Bain and Company's 2022 study, Bank's Great Carbon Challenge, illustrates some potential scenarios for pioneers, followers, and laggards. You can see on the left-hand side that before 2025, there's very little differentiation between the three. It may even seem like all the actions that the pioneers are taking will not pay off. By 2030, differentiation becomes much clearer, with pioneers beginning to make their mark. However, followers and laggards are still neck and neck. But by 2050, we see the race vastly widen, with pioneers ultimately growing profit 25 to 30%, and laggards seeing profits decline by 10 to 20%. 2050 may seem far from now. However, what this shows is that decisions made today have a dramatic impact on the future. It's why in previous slides, we've talked about the long-term strategy required and why setting near-term targets, like the ones that science-based targets requires, are so important. It's critical to start making the change this decade to prepare for a net zero future. Yes, there's a strong case for change and key actors, including financial institutions, are actively participating in helping align the global economy to 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, we'd be remiss to not recognize that significant questions and challenges remain. What role should the financial sector play versus policy in transforming the economy? Central question over the next decade, and we're all working together to see how that plays out. Which actions will be mandated by regulators and which will continue to be voluntary? We see some regulators converging around certain things like disclosure in particular, but it's uncertain what's to come. How central does decarbonization have to be to set strategy for firms to succeed? Decarbonization and ESG more broadly is going to be a key strategic consideration for companies for the next decades. How to quantify the opportunities and benefits of investing early in climate mitigation. We have some early evidence on returns, but the evidence will bear out further over time. Those who invest early will be the ones who learn the fastest and can really reap the rewards of participating actively in the new economy. What benefit can targets and commitments provide when data is still limited? You have to start somewhere. SBTI is fundamental to helping companies select climate goals, but acknowledges that starting on the basis of incomplete and imperfect data is challenging. However, setting a science-based target is the catalyst to push for better data quality and accelerate energy transformation over time. Concluding this module, you should leave with a few key takeaways. Greenhouse gas emissions must be halved by 2030 and brought to net zero by 2050 to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and minimize the most severe impacts of climate change. Financial institutions have a unique opportunity to enable, support, and track decarbonization. Net zero transformation will require both near-term capability building and long-term strategy to secure a decarbonized future. Pioneers may benefit from increased profitability, industry recognition, and higher quality green portfolios in the medium and long term. Thank you for listening to this module.